Kmart get the blue light special? Uh, get is your is get it on? Not on yet. Yeah, no, oh, okay. I got set up. I got those. That's okay. You're, you're just, you knew it was three chapters. I think you said there's going to be four lessons, so that's why I got it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you want to get feedback? And then do a little testing, testing, there we go. Microphone check, make a microphone check, make sure the background. You got the camera running there, because I know you love your YouTube page. Matt's second source of income, church church pays him, and then all the YouTube hits from our HSM channel. Yeah, uh, bring so in the money. Just, just like a billion, and one million behind uh, side. All right, so second Peter. Okay. And then we're going to put that tent. Um, All right. So we're starting school pretty soon. How many guys have two more weeks? Three weeks? You guys excited about that? All right. Well, with school, you guys hopefully have some true teachers. Uh, tonight we'll be kind of doing a brief overview of Second Peter and what he will be teaching warning about is false teachers. So that's one of the messages, uh, especially in chapter two. Some of you might remember these. You, you would have been in the back seat of your car. Uh, it's a little sub. If you're a freshman, you would have been facing backwards because you were so young. Uh, when these were out, you had your little, little pacifier and your rattle in the back seat. And these were prominent. These were a lot. These were put up by a big media mogul, Christian radio. Uh, preacher. He owned at one time, I think, like 150 mass big markets in the United States. So basically, every city had one of his radio stations and still in existence here. You can go on uh, your radio and listen to it. And so we see here the world was coming to an end. Some of you are like, oh man, I missed it. Left behind. Or I watch The Simpsons, left below. Uh, no, you didn't actually miss it. So these were around there. He's coming again. He even quotes scripture there. And so through this discernment, this preacher was saying, hey, the end of the world's coming. Uh, it didn't, okay? So he had all these followers, put billboards all over the place. I remember driving and seeing one in Santa Clara around El Camino. And so it never happened, obviously. And so then it's like, oh, sorry, I miscalculated. Uh, he, he forgot to add the number of fish, 153 fish, that um, was caught after uh, Jesus said, cast your net on the other side. So after I had those 153 days, it'll, it'll be that day we'll, we'll come. And of course, that never came either. And so, you know, Christians put up like this. Like, that was awkward because it hurts the r real church, okay? All real churches still had, uh, you know, uh, services planned and things like that because we knew it's like the Bible says that. And so we have to know that there are sometimes going to be false teachers, false prophets. Uh, now, it is, as we see here, but of course, in the time of Peter also. And so that was, again, sad events, because again, this hurts you know, true Christians too. People kind of get ostracized from the church. A lot of people gave up everything that they owned uh, just for warnings, because they thought, oh, well, in the world, I'll need my money. And some of his followers gave up a lot, so it was very sad. Okay, so Second Peter is what we're looking at tonight. Now, it did take a little uh, while to get canonized, as they call it, just because of the authorship. They weren't too sure there was some disputes early on. But after careful investigation, they knew that there was sufficient uh, internal and external evidence that Peter wrote it. The criteria, and by the way, canon is one in there. We just saw the canons of uh, Phil Wickham two ends here, but Canada Scripture is that's how we got our Bible. So they had to, of course, go through it very thoroughly to make sure, because there's lots of letters at the time in different books, then make sure that, hey, this is something that God, this is Holy Scripture. And so the criteria is that it was from an apostle, an apostle wrote it, or under what's called the apostolic umbrella. So someone like Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts, uh, kind of working with apostles, uh, it has to agree with the canon of truth. It can't contradict scripture. It has to be self-authenticating in nature. And, of course, did the church accept it? Let's see if we can see. 
Second Peter. So Second Peter, as you see, please turn it off. There we go. So it was one of those that was accepted by the majority. And then there's again, this was accepted in the, uh, Laodicea and Carthage is when Second Peter was added. Number two. Uh, you might have some friends who have a intertestable books called the Apocrypha, uh, like a Catholic Bible and some other denominations too. So we have 66 books. We have 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. That's called the canon of Scripture. So the Bible we have has 66 books. So Peter, Second Peter, was written around the year AD 65 or AD 66. Not long after he wrote 1 Peter, maybe a year or two after that, in the third chapter of this book, verse 1, it says, This now, beloved, is the second letter I'm writing to you. So, I'm referring back to the first letter. It was written not uh, long before his death. In 2 Peter 1.14, he says, Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Remember at the very end of John, John chapter 21, he was telling Peter about kind of, he's going to have the martyr's death. He's kind of walking side by side with Jesus. Jesus tells him that. I kind of look back at John, like, hey, what about him? I feel like I've had this martyr's death and all the other apostles, and not him. And Jesus like, you know, don't worry, I've got him. If I want him to live, I'll let him live. Tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down under Nero's persecution not finding himself worthy of dying in the same manner as Jesus was crucified and wanted to be crucified upside down. And so you can see the major themes. Uh, in the first chapter, he's talking about the growth in Christ. And then the major one here in two, warning about false prophets, false teachers. And then in chapter three, looking at the last days, how there's going to be uh, mocking and the other things that Christians have to go through in the last days. So, 1 Peter was written to encourage his readers to respond properly to external opposition. This letter focuses on internal opposition. 1 Peter focused on holiness, harmony, and hope. This letter focuses on holiness, heresy, and hope. But as we take a look at it, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. It's a blessing to have your word. Uh, a lot of people around the planet don't have access to it, so we thank you they're able to read it and to study it intently, just verse by verse, to understand what the context was and what it meant to the readers, and also how we can apply it today. So may your Holy Spirit guide us and direct us as we want to know the truth from the Word. Amen. Okay, verse 1. Simon Peter, bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when you guys write letters, you usually have the greeting, and then you have the heading first, first, and then the greeting, the body, the closing, and then the signature. As you read the New Testament letters, you see that they usually have the authorship right away. As you see here, first, signature first, and like our correspondences, he mentions both. In his first letter, he just put Peter. Here he puts Simon and Peter. Uh, you might see some of the ancient, man the earlier manuscripts had Simeon. Simeon is the Greek name for Simon. As we see in Acts 15, 14, uh, Petros, that is the Greek form of Peter. It's a masculine pronoun, which means a stone. And generally, it's a smaller stone than the feminine form of Petra. Ask your parents if they remember the greatest 70s Christian rock band. They'll say Petra. Uh, it refers to a massive rock or a foundation boulder. For example, Jesus says, hey, don't build your house on the sand, you build it on this bedrock, on the Petra. Peter is the Greek equivalent of the Syriac and Aramaic name of Cephas. So we read the New Testament, you guys say Cephas, also that's Peter. Now Peter is very special. We see that because his names uh, are always first. Whenever the 12 apostles are listed, it says the first Simon is also called Peter. That's from Matthew 10, 2. And the other two synoptic gospels of Mark and Mark 3.16 and Luke 6.14. His name is listed first of all 12 of the uh, disciples. And then I mentioned before John chapter 21, right before that, when he was talking with Peter about, again, the type of death he would have. 
it was him, and only him, of all the apostles and disciples that he told to tend my lambs, shepherd my sheep, and tend my sheep. And if you're a pastor, that's the key role, the main role. They have lots of different responsibilities, but the key role of a pastor is to, again, tend the lambs, to shepherd the flock, since they represent them, again, the word of God, the word of teaching. In Matthew 16, 18, it says, And I also shall say to you that you are Peter, Petros, a little piece of rock. And upon this rock, Petra, bedrock, I will build my church. So you see the same words used in English, but it is different. And the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. So again, it's not first and the last name. You might remember it says Simon Barjona, Bar means son of. And so Peter was this nickname that Jesus gave to him. Now, among the 12, there's three of them who are really close to Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And he mentions that in this. One of the reasons we know that this is Simon Peter mentions the transfiguration of that. In 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, he says, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his ministry. So he saw it. Again, when he had Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, where it was Peter, he's like, oh, this is really cool. Let me build these tabernacles for you. And Jesus like, no, no, no. Not the reason we're here. He mentions his title, servant and apostle, same as Paul did in Romans 1.1 1, 1 and Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Here we see the two sides of the Christian life. We see his general relationship as a servant and his special position as an apostle. And note the order that he puts it. Because if you're an apostle, you think, well, everyone's a servant. If you're a Christian, you're a servant of Jesus. But kind of like you with a general, right? You put your stars up here. You've got all your uh, you know, stripes. You want people to see it. But he mentions that he's a servant first. So very humble. Bond servant. Uh, the Greek is doulos. It's the most abject, servile Greek term for a slave. Of the five words that were used to describe one who serves another. In the New Testament, doulos refers to one who serves another, like the Lord, without regard for his own personal interests. In the present context, Peter uses apostle in its more common restricted meaning to denote one of the twelve disciples whom Jesus chose, trained, and commissioned to be his representatives. In Acts 1, 21 and 22, Peter delineates the necessary qualifications of this latter select group. He says, therefore, it's necessary that of the men who have accompanied, accompanied us at this time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. Of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So again, there's a very select group who could be an apostle. The word received or obtained, as it is in the King James Version, it's uh, lachano in Greek. It's a distinctive verb used only four times in the New Testament. When Peter seems to be teaching by using the verb machano, it's that salvation he and his readers had obtained was not the result of any personal merit or self-effort on their part. It was allotted as a gift from God. So we take a look here. So that's very important. But look at Acts 16, 14. And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So it wasn't anything that she did on her own. She wasn't like, oh, this is such a great message. And then I recognized this as something that she initiated. It was only granted to her, her ability to respond to the external calling. She had to have this internal calling, too, that she was able to respond. So it's of the same kind. Uh, in the King James Version, it says, like precious faith. Uh, it's kind of interesting where we see this word later, too, precious. You kind of think of Peter, this rugged fisherman, using it. Uh, the Greek word isotimos means equally precious, equally honored to be esteemed equal to. This word was particularly used in connection with foreigners who were given equal citizenship in a city with the natives. That's what Paul and Silas had said right after this event with Lydia. When they were released, he's like, hey, you know, we we Esomos, okay? We were Roman citizens. You might not know that, but we weren't supposed to be flogged out in the public square and treated as we were since we have Esomos. We have this equal um, standing as Roman citizens. Now, when Peter uses this word, you know, think of the song, 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the word precious there, and also says, what can make me whole again? Again, he uses Simon Peter. This is something I'm sure he grasped with. Simon was his birth name. Peter was what he wanted to be. That's what Jesus called him. I want to be a rock. And so he says this, I messed up, and like I got called Simon. I'm sure he kind of felt like, oh, I'm doing the Lord's work, and he got called Peter. Because we all want to strive to be a Peter. But again, the sign of nature in us shows up. By the righteousness of God and his Savior, Jesus Christ. While on equal footing on the cross, Peter reminds the recipients that his point is that believers share the equal gift of salvation because God's righteousness is imputed, which means credited to them. So not only do they have faith because God gives it to them, they are saved only because God imputes righteousness to them. We can read 1 Corinthians 1, 29 and 31. And then we see the divine nature of Jesus Christ. He is God and he is Savior. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Paul, again, always uses the same words, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Grace before peace. It's not like when you write grandma, so you might write to her hugs and kisses, and next time kisses and hugs. He always put grace before peace. Grace is God's free and unmerited favor bestowed on guilty men in and through Jesus Christ by faith. Peace, here, it's not the absence of pain or absence of conflict or absence of testing times. This book itself, 2 Peter, says you will be faced with deceptive teachers who want to do you harm. And there's also going to be mockers. We will have tribulation in the world. But again, the Prince of Peace has overcome the world. But divine peace, the peace that the Spirit gives, does mean that in our pain, in our conflicts, and in our testing times, we can have genuine inner peace. Now, Peter in Acts, after again he was speaking, it says that, and there were, this is from Acts 2.41, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Peter's like, let's just forget the addition. I want some geometric, some exponential growth. He says, let it be multiplied. Okay, you kind of think of like, you take like one little piece of corn, you put it in the ground, and then get this whole 10 foot stalk with all these ears of corn. Each ear has hundreds of different kernels on it. And so you get the idea of sowing the seed of the word. You get a productive crop, growth like Peter saw early in the church. In the knowledge. Now, some of you might remember Pastor Darren talking about this four years ago. So he told us that there's different Greek words. So I looked it up, and yeah, so if you remember epigenosis, we don't have any of the sites kids here today. Otherwise, I'm sure they probably remember it. I'm sure like Carolyn brought home a report card, and Ethan's like, nah, dad, that's his gnosis. I got epigenosis here with mine. I got super knowledge is the word. It conveys the idea of a more intimate and personal relationship than the simple term gnosis. It's an advanced, fuller super knowledge. It's relational knowing of the Father and Son through the Holy Spirit who makes it real to us. In 1 Peter 1.23, he wrote, For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding word of God. Now, that's compared to Gnosis, which he does use uh, later on here in 5 and 6, verse 5 and 6. I looked up in Strong's, the uh, concordance in the Greek dictionary. It says knowledge, and then the word science by it. And I thought, oh yeah, it's kind of a doctor's chart. Now, if you haven't the same pediatrician since birth, pediatrician knows you pretty well. If you're like 17, seeing you grow, knows a lot about you, it will be someone who invites you to your birthday party or would be very good at giving a eulogy. So they don't know you too well. Uh, it's basically what your senses can tell you. And I was thinking of Romans 1.20. God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature were clearly seen and understood. Verse 21. <clears throat> For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So basic knowledge of God through creation, that's not enough. Just kind of knowing that there's a God out there. He's like, no, you want to have this intimate, true knowledge. <clears throat> First Corinthians 13, 11 through 12. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. 
when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I've also been fully known. And so you get this idea I have, it's kind of like a translucent glass almost. So you can maybe make out someone, but it might not really be them. Okay, this is kind of good to maybe obscure different things if you want some light coming in. But it's nothing like a real window, if it's transparent. And so if you have that kind of relationship with God where you kind of know him, it's kind of like this you know, fuzzy outline. He's warning you against that. He's like, no, there's so much more, so much richness. If you study the word of God, get to know him. And don't forsake the Old Testament too. We see here the Father's still working okay, in the New Testament with Jesus. And then we see another phrase here, Jesus our Lord, which is used only in Romans 4.24. In verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything. So God gives you everything you'll ever need for life and for godliness. It's like you have a full tank. Now the false teachers have claimed that they have this special doctrine, this secret knowledge. Uh, later on in the second century, especially the more Gnostics would come, uh, that they would add something to the life of Peter's readers. But Peter counters this false teaching. <coughs> we have the word granted. It means given, like you're given like permission. A free gift uh, for a particular purpose is like a grant. You might have heard of a land grant, money grant, research grant. Well, we've been granted this. We are stewards of our body and resources. We need to use them wisely to help us grow spiritually and plant seeds of encouragement in others. So again, this is true knowledge. It's not just book knowledge. This isn't just like, oh, it's kind of like a biography about God. It's kind of like a biography. If I read like five of George Washington, I'll kind of know him. Like, no, you can't have a personal, deep relationship with him. He's dead. This is the living God that he wants us to make sure that we are reading thoroughly so we get to know him. It's intimate. It's experiential knowledge. Again, it's epigenosis. I'll give you a second to read the first uh, verse four. Right? Again, the word precious. Yeah, this is post Pentecost Peter here. It's still the running fisherman. It's valuable, desirable, and costly. He recognizes this. The word magnificent. This is the only place it's used in the New Testament. So you probably saw this word. Uh, King James, it says, exceeding great. So Peter had to come up with words, megithos, in Greek. So it's just like, it's not just great. It's like the superlative form of it. That's how wonderful this promise is that we have. We're equipped to live life according to the will of God. And again, it's his promises. He's going to carry out what he says. It's guaranteed because it's promised from the Lord. A partaker, it's one who fellowships and shares something in common with another. He or she takes part in something with someone else. The Greek form of this word is koinonos, which is a derivative of koinonia. You've probably heard the word koinonia. It's fellowship. It's participating with others. We're not lone children of God. Again, there's no lone ranger Christians. We have siblings. We have companions in the faith. Corruption. This is like super corruption here, the Greek word phthora. It describes decomposition of rotting of organism. So if you kind of think something's rotting like milk coming or smell like the rotting milk and I left it, it like kind of looks like turned into this you know, horrible stench. Or maybe meat with maggots on it. That's the idea of corruption here. And then we have the word lust. Uh, we went over that word a few weeks ago. We're talking about the difference between love and lust. So lust is self gratification. Verse 5 through 7 at the very bottom. Lots of different attributes. Some of our discussion questions will focus on these, so look at them. Diligence. When you are diligent, you're alert, you're focused, you're committed to the task at hand. You're single-minded, careful, businesslike. Now the faith he speaks of here is faith that causes us to act, demands action. In Habakkuk 2, 4, it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Supply means to furnish abundantly, generously, and lavishly with a sense of urgency. 
Within God's sovereignty, there's human responsibility. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We want to make sure we're fruit bearers. We don't want to, again, see the Lord in the sense, like, where's your fruit? We want to make sure that we are productive here. With our little time we have. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if these qualities are yours, they're existing. You're continually possessing them. And you know you're salt. You're being called salt. You're also being called light. You want your Christian light to have increasing wattage. Okay, not like if you're when you're four years old, those little easy bake ovens are the small little light where it took like 10 hours to make a little brownie. Okay, this is something where it's just kind of like these bright lights in my eyes right now. Okay, it's shining brightly for God. Uh, ever increasing too. Okay, you might have heard the metaphor like being a Christian, it's like you're on a downward going escalator. If you're not moving up, if you're not actively moving up, again, you're keep going down. You need to move, move your faith. Neither useless nor unfruitful. We shouldn't be idle. Okay? Unprofitable, worthless, unproductive. In uh, the parable of the talents in Matthew, okay? the ones who did something with it, it's like, here, here are the talents. They went and invested it, and they had a return for their master. In Luke, it's the parable of the minus. Same thing. You had the ones that returned it. But in both parables, you had someone who's like, eh, we'll just bury it. And then you know, the master shows up like, here, didn't do anything, I sat on it. You didn't even get interest in the bank. No, bank's way down there. We can't do that as Christians. Knowledge. Peter sees a true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ as the goal of our spiritual growth. Verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Blind. So the Greek word here, myopia. Right? Heard myopic, I'm myopic, I'm nearsighted. So he says, don't be nearsighted spiritually. You're allowed to be physically. Uh, and then having forgotten, it's like you have spiritual amnesia. You're lacking foresight and discernment. It's like you cannot focus on this temporal world. You have to be kingdom minded, eternal minded. His purification. Jesus has cleansed us from unrighteousness. Okay, you can't forget that. Think of all the lepers he healed. Do you think they forgot it? Their friend, like, hey, uh, you know, like, you remember three years ago, you know, like your arm was falling off? Like, oh, I forgot that. Like, no, they never forget. The leper would never have forgotten being ostracized, the putrid stench of the rotting flesh. And yet, how easy it is for Christians to sometimes forget what Jesus did for us, how we're cleansed from unrighteousness, which again is a far greater gift than just from actual leprosy. From his former sins. I put the image here because it's kind of tempting. Okay, you see here, this is the windshield, and you have the rear view mirror. Now, any new drivers out there? Any, any new drivers who actually got their license today? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, see, I've got a license today. So, new drivers, so how often should you be looking in the rear view mirror? Never? Okay, no, you're right. That's to hang my little scented pine from. Uh, no, well, about four to seven seconds. You take a glance, right? You just, just a quick glance for safety, because you have to leave yourself a way out. And it's important to do that. But you focus, and this is just you know, a few square inches. The whole big wind, that's where you're going. You go through the windshield itself. And so for our former sins, it can help us make better decisions now. So we kind of think of the things we did, but you cannot dwell on it. If God has forgotten it, again, east from the west, if he's forgiven, then you've got to forgive yourself. And so you cannot dwell on it. So, again, when you're making new decisions, just check a quick glance at that rearview mirror of your life. Say, okay, is there anything that I did before that might not pan out as well so, because we're learning from our mistakes? But do not dwell on your former sins. Don't dredge up the memories of former sins. And sin itself, the Greek word here is hamartia. So in the Bible, it means to miss the mark. Okay, like the Disney version of Robin Hood there. 
It means to miss God's mark and ultimately to miss the true purpose and end of our lives, which is God himself. But if you're not in the word, if you're not reading, like, okay, what does God have in store for me? What is my mark as a Christian? It's just that I close your eyes and you're going to hit it, right? That's not good. And then if you're just getting your Christian advice from people who aren't really experts, who don't know the word themselves, or what society tells you, oh, this is good, oh, this is right, this is wrong. Well, no, who says it? You're pointing it too high against those, yeah, kind of deified Robin Hood here. But if we're kind of thinking of this, it's like, is he going to get a better lesson? Absolutely, like, this is Robin Hood teaching him. And so if you're under the tutelage of a great pastor, okay, at a great church, and other parachurch ministries, too, that are solid and biblical, you're going to grow as a Christian. You're going to be on sure footing for this life and the assurance for the life to come, too. Okay. Uh, next one here. Let's see. So, 2 Peter 1.10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. Never stumble. So we want to make sure, again, be more diligent to be certain about these things. It commands a definitive action and conveys a sense of urgency. Now, if we take a look at these verses here, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Now, this next one, a little scary. Because a lot of times we think, like, okay, if people don't want anything to do with God, he's not going to force them into heaven. There are a lot of people who are like, no, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't like God. I want to do life my own way. But these are people who go up to Jesus, Lord, Lord. It's, it's using the name twice. Whenever you see it in the Bible, it's a really a term of endearment. So these are people who think that they're saved, and Jesus says, no, you're not my sheep. I don't know what Jesus you were following, but it wasn't me. I don't know what, you know, you thought, but this isn't me. The fact that you practice lawlessness, that's scary. So again, that's why we have to make sure that, wow, okay, what I'm being taught, what is the Bible says is true, especially in a few years, because you're going to be making a decision about what church you go to. A lot of you can't afford to stay in this area. You're going to be away at the university, and you're going to have to find a church home. And you're going to be, you know, you have to find a healthy church. Because if you just go somewhere, you're not sure, it's like, well, it's got like a cross on the top of it. Sure, they're teaching about Jesus. Uh, there's some that teach Jesus, maybe like 85% true, but this other 15% is like heresy, that's a completely different Christ. And he was saying, for this reason I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted. The Father has to give you to the Son. Look at the order here. Okay, he's not condemning these people. It doesn't say, well, here's the cause. The cause comes first. He's not saying, oh, you don't believe me? Then you're not part of my sheep. I'm not going to be your shepherd because you don't believe me. Look at the order. First, you are not my sheep. Since you're not my sheep, you do not believe. Okay, they haven't been chosen. And then the last one too. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purposes and grace, which was granted us from Jesus Christ from all eternity. Because what we tend to do is like kind of Dr. Strange. Well, I'm sure that God kind of looked ahead in time and he, he knew that I was going to accept Jesus because he had heard what Christ did on the cross and, oh, this person's going to serve at BBS and they're going to sing in the choir. So, yeah, I'll choose them based on what they're going to do. But no, that's, that's not what the Bible says. Anyone recognize? Anyone recognize? Him? So deep theological from the Reverend Max. Okay, it's not good. Okay, but anyone, anyone hear this before? Anyone maybe like waist deep in water heard this? Yes, okay, yeah. So Cindy heard this. Just see what Max Dead in sins, and there was nothing you could do yourself to merit. It wasn't like God from eternity past looked at Sydney like, 
oh, well, if she, if she hears my message, then she will choose. She will be good. No. It's in God's favor anyway. There's nothing we can do. In our sinful state, there will be none of us. No one would have chosen the cross and what Jesus did for us. Nary a one. Last verse. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord, Savior, and Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. So calling and choosing. Calling means a call and was used for an invitation to a banquet. In the New Testament, the word is used metaphorically or the call or invitation to come to the kingdom of God with its privileges. So who are the called? They are those who have heard. The Lord Jesus made it clear when he said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they will follow me. In both the writings of Peter and Paul, when they mention called, call, or calling, the reference is to an effectual call. That's a call that's answered, and thus the called equates essentially with those who are the chosen or the elect. Peter pointed out that calling and election go together. The same God who elects his people also ordains the means to call them. The two must go together, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification, by the spirit and faith that the truth is for this he called you through our gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. So, you might picture kind of like adoption, when it's like adoption of sons or daughters, the way we would do it. It's not that way. It's not like you go there at the pound and find like a puppy all years old. You, you're the cutest puppy, I'll pick you and I'll pick you. That's not how we have been chosen. Uh, if you want to take a picture of these two, uh, well, I have two slides, so I'm kind of get your cameras out on them. And this will help our discussion questions, because they don't want you to go away thinking, you know, oh, where will I go when I die? Again, if you look at all this, we have, we can have confidence. Okay? It's not like, oh, I hope God's going to, no, you can have full conviction if you are part of the elect. Next one, too. So here's the verse before the ones are right here. Who will? He who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. So if you're doing that, you're part of the kingdom. So again, we have to have an eternal kingdom mindset. What a gift we receive to live the life to the fullest and be able to look ahead to eternity with God and all his glory. It provides encouragement to watch out for the false teachers and false prophets who are mentioned in chapter 2 and also the travails that will occur for believers as mentioned in chapter 3. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we can delve into it. Uh, thank you for the resources we have now where we can just really pick it apart and get the understanding and glean what you uh, need and want for us. Uh, thank you again for what your son did on the cross. Pray now that your spirit will guide us as we look at the discussion questions. Amen.